so I'm going to talk to you about what we did, uh, real life lessons, what we did well, what we did wrong, um, moving, migrating to multi-tenant cloud native. And uh, hopefully you'll get some ideas, some things that will be useful for, for, your, for your projects. So let's, well, first, thank you for being here. And instead of, I know there's a Lakers game at the same time. So thank you for coming here. And who's here? Who knows about Kubernetes? <laughs> OK. Who's, who's using Kubernetes in production? OK, so almost everybody. Um, OK, so let's talk about, well, this is all done. And because we are in a small audience, let's, you can interrupt me whenever you want. Ask me any questions you have. Um, I'm going to talk about a little introduction about what Adobe Experience Manager is so you understand the challenges here. So it's an existing distributed Java OSGI application. So it was, before we move it to the cloud, it was already a distributed application. So that had already some benefits. People could run this on-prem across multiple VMs, multiple uh, machines, and so on. It's, it would scale horizontally. So that was something that made it our life easier. It uses a lot of open source components from the Apache Foundation, and it has a huge market for extension developers, people that write code to run on the EM platform. So this is going to be interesting later on. So what we did was let's take AM and run it on Kubernetes, because Kubernetes, 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 right? And we are currently running on Azure. We have 45 more than 45 clusters, and we keep growing over time. And because we are a content management system, we run across multiple regions. Uh, whatever the, the customer, our customers want to have the content closer, as close as possible to their customers. So we have U US, Europe, Australia, Singapore, Japan, India, and whatever new region that comes up, we'll probably take it. And another interesting fact at Adobe is that we have a dedicated team building uh, the clusters for us, so what is called today a platform team, because platform is the new trendy word. And that also limits what type of things we can do, right? The cluster, we don't own the clusters. Uh, we have another team that provides a cluster, and I think this is gonna be, if it's not already, it's gonna be very typical in any big corp company where there's going to be a team that is going to give you access to the clusters, or even a cloud provider where you say, OK, I'll, I'll take the cluster, but I cannot do everything I would be able to do in a local cluster that I run. For, the, for good reasons and bad reasons, you not, you're not going to be able to do everything you, want. you, you could do. We have uh, 17,000 environments. and. What an environment is, is uh, a set of deployments that we give a customer. So a customer can have multiple environments, and this comprises multiple Kubernetes deployments and services and Kubernetes objects and so on. And that means that we have more than 100,000 deployment objects in, Kubernetes, in all our Kubernetes clusters. That's also... Uh, that means also we have over 6,000 namespaces. So that's more or less the scale we as AM, just the single product at Adobe, uh, the scale that we have. An environment for AM is uh, something that the customer self serves. So they come to a UI, well, an API, they say, oh, I want a new environment, a new environment. Uh, can be a dev a stage production environment for them. And uh, so they can have multiple dev environments, one stage, one production. That, that means at least they have three environments. And each environment has their own, it's, a, it's like a Helm chart with their own deployment services and so on. And these environments are also separated by Kubernetes namespace for isolation. So each customer means at least they're going to use three Kubernetes namespaces. And each environment is what I like to call a micro monolith. So we took the uh, Java application that customers were, could run on-prem or on a VM, or we could run on the cloud for them already on a VM. And now we take this and we run it in Kubernetes containers, in Kubernetes pods. 
we use namespaces to provide the scopes uh, for the multi-tenancy part. Namespaces in Kubernetes give you network isolation, quotas, permissions. So you can say, okay, I don't want a namespace to talk to another namespace. Uh, I don't want a namespace to grow over this much amount in case you misconfigure something and, and the scale is uncontrolled. And uh, yeah, I don't want a, a namespace to see things in another namespace. So that's all what you get for free in Kubernetes when you use namespaces. We have multiple services, multiple teams building services, and different teams have different requirements. So we kind of leave, let people do whatever they want in a more of a you build it, you run it mentality. Uh, so we help them um, because I'm sitting more on the on top of the Kubernetes part and the, on the layer on the more a bit infrastructure, not so much application side. We tell uh, people building the the services on top. Okay, you can you can do a bit of whatever you want. Just have these things into account. You want to use GoLand, you want to use Node, you want to use Java. That's fine. And. The model we are following is API patterns, so services have APIs and operator patterns, where we build operators that will do actions on the uh, clusters, on the environments, and uh, everything. So the operator pattern Kubernetes, if you are not familiar with it, is uh, of a managing state. You create a custom resource definition in Kubernetes, then you have an operator that is a service that is continuously running and monitoring these custom resources and saying, what is the desired state? And are we in that desired state or I need to make changes? So the operator keeps the reconcili reconciliation loop forever, checking when there's changes to one of these custom resources, what things need to be done. So this is very useful when you have um, for instance, the Helm operator. The Helm operator, you create an object that defines, I want to install this chart with these values in the cluster, and in this namespace. The oper Helm operator goes and always looks, okay, is this installed? No, I need to install it. Has this changed? Yes, oh, I need to update it. So that's the operator pattern, and we use it for a, for a bunch of services. On the environment side, we use init containers and many sidecars to do division of concerns. So on Kubernetes, you have the concept of init containers, things, containers that run before your main containers run, and sidecars, containers that run alongside your main container. And this has been, there's a new feature on Kubernetes where you ha can have more init containers or sidecars that start as init containers and become sidecars. That's in the latest uh, versions. And that is useful for things like logging. So you, when you want logging, you want the logging sidecar to start as early as possible and start lo shipping logs somewhere. And you want it to continue to run all the time. Before this, I think this was in the last version. Uh, before that, you will have init containers and main containers or, or the main container of the sidecars and they were separate. Now you can have one that spans from the very beginning to the very end of the life of the pod. On the sidecar part, uh, yeah, the division of concerns um, model that we follow is instead of adding more things to the main container and to the Java application that is already a big micro monolith or whatever you want to call it, we create sidecars in containers that, that, that do specialized things so we, don't, we can separate them and it's better different teams manage them, they follow their own uh, release cycle and so on. So we have service warm-up, storage initialization, we have an HTTPD server fronting the Java application for caching and for other configurations. Uh, Sidecar containers that export the metrics to Prometheus, Fluent Bit for logging. Um, to, in Java, we can collect thread dumps and ship them also and store them. Uh, for, uh, net, for more advanced networking, we use Envoy 
Envoy is a proxy, and I'll talk about, I think I'll, in, a, in a following slide, and, and another is the auto-updater. So the service warm-up, for instance, is a, is a service um, that when the co pod comes up, it starts hitting the most requested URLs, so they are warm in the cache before the pod is receiving traffic. So we manage the readiness probe in Kubernetes, so the, when the pod come up, comes up, before saying it's ready to accept traffic, we warm it up. We warm the cache, and then it, it can mark itself as ready and start getting traffic. And it does this lazy caching without having to do very expensive starts. FluentBit is a very typical solution to, to use. You run it as a sidecar, you have a shared volume where your main application or all your containers are writing logs to. FluentBit reads those logs from the file system and ships them wherever you want. I mean, you could do this from the main application, main container, and whatever, but this makes it easier to change it without having to deal with the application. So it's the separation of concerns. And we can configure it independently. We can say, oh, we need to upgrade log, uh, uh, fluent bit. We don't have to make a release of the main application. We can just do behind the scenes an update the fluent bit without um, changes to customers. Envoy proxy, every, who knows Envoy? Okay, just a few people. Envoy is a, a very widely used proxy engine on Kubernetes. It's used for, uh, by a lot of service meshes behind the scenes. So if you use Istio, if you use uh, serv um, pretty much all the service meshes, use Envoy as a proxy inside. And we use it uh, because we have customers that say, oh, I need to connect to my internal VPN to, do, to get some data, or I need to, to go out to the internet using a dedicated IP because I don't want to get affected by other tenants in the clusters, and I want to use a dedicated IP just for myself because maybe uh, you have one tenant that is doing a lot of requests to a service and you're getting throttled. So we have this ability. Uh, having dedicated IPs, VPN connectivity. What we do is in the pod, we run an Envoy sidecar. We send the traffic from the job application to that proxy, that Envoy proxy. That Envoy proxy does uh, uh, an MTLS tunnel over HTTP to a VM that goes out to the internet with a dedicated pipe. So that's how we, we implemented it. Now you have more options, and there's uh, tools by cloud providers that will make this easier to say, oh, I want these specific pods to go out through this specific network route, and that network route can have VPN, can have other things. So there's, the, the cloud providers are, are giving you more out-of-the-box functionality. The out-of-data is, is a sidecar or init container that we created. Anybody heard about the log4j CV? <laughs> well, if, if you were not under a rock, you probably heard about it. So now, suddenly, we are running these thousands of deployments, and we are, have to just figure out how do we upgrade log4j in all of them. And because the environments are in control from, by the users, so the user can say, oh, I want, uh, I want to upgrade now, or I don't want to upgrade, or they're using a specific version of AM. We have to go and say, uh, okay, whatever version of AM you're using, log4j has to be upgraded. So what we did was adding this init container that on a startup uh, does changes on the file system before your ma the main container starts. So different people have done it in different ways, um, but we chose this because it was a bit transparent, but not too magical. So every time your pod starts, this init container can do whatever you want, right? Can go into the file system and set a file, change something, and that way we can control this without changing the, the, the main application, the Java application uh, at all. And this allows us to patch the whole cluster for life. 
So if tomorrow we have another issue, uh, we can go and say, okay, just changing the, the container for the sub to updater, we can do whatever we want. Any questions so far? Yes? Oh, sorry. This probably isn't worthy of being recorded, but just so in theory for log4j, are you running through and like going through every POM file in AEM and no. updating something? Okay. No, we, we patch, we don't rebuild. We patch it in the, in the main application container file okay. system. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Just want a clarification. Because we, I mean, we, we run the same applications, just different versions and different things. So we know where to go. It's like, oh, in the file system, log4j is here in this path, and the version is old one affected by the CV, then just copy the other file over. On the operator side, um, as I mentioned, we use a bunch of operators. So we started with, uh, or or we created one that I think on the operator side is what makes business sense or what makes functionality sense for you. We created an AM environment operator that goes and uh, you create a custom resource that defines an environment and that operator goes and looks at that and because that makes business sense in, in when you create an environment, you just create an object, one object. You don't need to create 20 different objects. You just go and create one object, and then the operator will go look at that object and the, the parameters, and then it will do other things. But from the, your business point of view is, oh, I'm creating one environment, and the, the unit is the environment, so I create one object. And this manages this life cycle of environment. So when I create a, this object, this custom resource, I'm going to end with an environment running. If I delete it, I'm going to end with the environment deleted, and it makes this uh, semantic sense. And this operator, instead of doing everything inside the operator, we also delegate to other operators. So for instance, we have to launch jobs before an environment is created this operator launches the jobs. And then it uses all these other internal operators to reconcile, uh, um, reconcile the status of the, of, of the environment. An example, open source, the FluxCD Helm operator. I mean, FluxCD is a GitOps operator and um, yeah, it allows you to, to deploy things to the cluster, uh, similar to, it's pretty much like Argo CD, uh, but also they have inside the, the umbrella of Flux, they have the Helm operator. So you can use this operator separately. You don't need to adopt the whole GitOps approach for each, for each of, just to, to take advantage of the Helm operator. So the Helm operator allows you to manage Helm charts uh, using declarative state. You create an object that is a Helm release the operator is going to watch the Helm release object, and oh, if, if this is created, it's running a Helm install. If it's changed, I'm running a Helm update, and so on. And it always keeps them uh, synchronized. So we, when we create a Hel uh, AM environment CR, the operator behind the scenes create a Helm release CR and, and other ones, and this changes the operators. So this way, we don't have to implement everything inside one operator, but we take advantage of other open source operators and operators that already exist and divide the functionality uh, across multiple operators. And it also, when the Helm operator reconciles the Helm uh, release, it writes the state into the Helm release, and we can take that state and put it back into the environment in a way that makes sense. So. It's a change of, of things that happen. Some of them happen in parallel, some of them happen one after another. Uh, Helm install, Helm updates, and a few other things, launching jobs and so on. And then the main operator says, you can go and see the main operator, uh, is the status of the main environment resource, and know what happened to all these like, sub-calls and change of workflows, let's say. 
Argo CD, we also use Argo CD. Um, again, is the whole, you can use the whole GitOps um, services that they provide. And it applies GitOps state into the cluster. It's very widely used at Adobe, and we contribute back to it. And it, you have different things inside, workflows, events. So you can also use, part, use parts of it. We use it for some namespaces. Um, so because our platform team has established Argo CD as, as a standard. So when we create uh, new services, we can just go to Git and say, OK, just deploy this with Argo CD. And behind, well, we don't even have to say that. We just onboard that, project, that Git repository, and it gets deployed with Argo CD. And Argo CD or Argo, the Argo the Umbrella project includes Argo rollouts, which you don't need to use Argo CD at all. But Argo rollouts, I think, is very cool because it allows you to do um, advanced deployment techniques, progressive delivery. So you can do canaries, blue greens, A-B testing, whatever. There's a bunch of different things that you can set up. And the very cool thing that it does is allow you to do automatic rollbacks. So you deploy, you configure your Argo rollouts object, you set some metrics, that's what we do. We set some metrics and say, uh, a successful rollout means that uh, less than 10% of the requests get an error. If there's more than 10% of the requests that get an error, Argo will automatically roll back to the previous uh, version. And you don't have to do anything. There's no manual checks, no, no nothing. Obviously, that requires you to have nice, good metrics and to have some sort of confidence on, on doing this. But it's very useful. If you, don't, if you use a service mesh, it, it gives you a lot more power where you can say, I want 1% of the traffic to go to the new version. If you don't use a service mesh, you can still use it. We don't use a service mesh. But it's just you are limited. Uh, you can only play with the number of pods. So if you have 10 pods, you can have one more and have 10% of the traffic going to that pod. Uh, but you cannot do 1% or 5%. Right? It's, you are a bit limited, but you can still do nice things, especially the automatic robot is very nice. On the, um, moving on to the how to scale and how to automate resources when you have big deployments and when you are coming from a bit of a monolith. So I mentioned that each environment, each of these 17,000 plus is a micro monolith. We have multiple team, teams building services. So we need ways to scale that are more orthogonal to, to the developer teams. So we don't have to go to each developer team and say, hey, change this, change that, change this other thing. On the Kubernetes world, uh, there's two important res um, resource concepts, requests and limits. Request is how many resources you have warranted. Limits is how many resources you can consume. And depending on what they're applied to, the result is different, the, the, the action is different. You can apply them to CPU, to memory, to ephemeral storage. And when you apply them to memory, the limit is enforced. So if you go over the limit, so you have guaranteed the request that you asked for, but if, and if you go over the limit, uh, your, um, your process in the, the container is gonna get killed. On the ephemeral storage part, the limit is also enforced. So if you use more storage, your pod is evicted. Pod eviction means that pod is removed from that node, and Kubernetes will schedule it in another node. So you probably are going to lose all the data that you had in the ephemeral storage. Well, probably not. You, you are going to lose all the data you have in the ephemeral storage, and your pod is going to start fresh somewhere else. A very interesting one is the CPU, the CPU uh, resources. And on the CPU request side, 
the requests are used for the scheduling. So you are saying, oh, I w I'm requesting one CPU for this pod or this container. So Kubernetes is going to find a node that has one CPU available, and it's going to put that there. And after, but after that, it's still used as a relative weight. So it's not the number of CPUs that can be used. It's a CPU, number of CPU cycles that the process can use. So if you have two, two containers running in a node, and they just request 0 0.1 CPU, they can all b both use at the same time 50% of the no, uh, CPU time. So this is a bit tricky because it, it, got, it, it got us, uh, we were figuring out what the hell is happening, and it, it tricks a lot of people. On the limit sides, this translates to C groups, quota, and period. As, as some people said containers are just processes. Containers do not contain. So they are just processes that have C groups, uh, kernel C groups um, enabled. So CPU limits are C groups quota, become C groups quota and period. The period is by default in the kernel 100 milliseconds. So the limit is the number of CPU cycles that can be used in that uh, 100 milliseconds. If your container is going over those uh, over that limit, your container is going to get throttled. So imagine you have one container that has one thread only, and it's using one core. You can and you request one CPU. Yeah, if you have a limit of a CPU, you're going to be fine. You're going to use one thread as much as you want. Uh, in one CPU, that's, that's going to be fine. It's going to run for the 100 milliseconds, and then it's going to get other 100 milliseconds, another 100 milliseconds, and so on. This is a bit challenging for Java applications and multiple thread applications. For instance, if you have, if you request one CPU, 100, 1,000 milli CPUs in Kubernetes, and you have four threads, now suddenly, if each thread uses all the CPU, in 25 milliseconds, you are done. You don't have more CPU time. So hopefully this makes it a bit clear. You have four threads, each thread in one core, different core. The period is 100 milliseconds, but after 25 milliseconds, you already consume 100 milliseconds of time across the four threads. So you're going to get throttled 75 milliseconds. And if you are doing the same thing, you're going to have over and over and over again. Every 100 milliseconds, you're going to only use uh, 25. So this is something very important if you are like serving uh, web requests. You're getting a, a request, and you look, oh, typically it was well. But now suddenly, the response time is going like <laughs> through the roof. What's happening? You look at the CPU throttling metrics that Kubernetes provides, and you realize that your container is being throttled. So that's something that also tricks, tricked us and tricks a lot of people. Yes? I can repeat the question. Is uh, OK, so that's the, that the million dollar question. Is Would I suggest using CPU limits in general? And the answer, I don't know if I have it later, but uh, the answer is, in production, you should not use CPU limits, because if you use CPU limits, you are artificially limiting the amount of CPU that you use. So you are leaving CPU unused for no good reason. So typically, uh, because the request is a relative weight, you have warranty that two processes are not going to starve each other. One process is not going to st starve the other one. So there's a relative weight between processes. If you set up a limit, imagine you have one, two processes. One is doing nothing. The other one wants to use a lot of CPU. If you have a limit to one CPU, that process is going to use only one CPU. But you have maybe a 16 CPU, 32 CPU node. You're wasting nodes. You're wasting uh, cores. So there's, it doesn't make any sense. 
even if you have the two, so if you remove the limits, one process is doing nothing, the other one wants to use a lot of CPU, it can go to 32 cores. The two processes want to use a lot of CPUs, if they have the same request, they can use 16 cores, 16 cores. So you don't have the problem of starvation between each other. For us, we, one consideration you have to do, like uh, we haven't made this change, we have it planned, but we want to re remove the limits in, in, the, in the production environments. But also imagine we have stage environments for clients and production environments, that for us is all production, but for them is, oh, I have my stage website and I have my production website. And they may run um, uh, performance tests on the stage. If you remove the limits and that pod happens to be, or those set of pods have, happen to be in empty nodes that don't have anything else, the performance can be great. But then the production pods are happening to have some noisy neighbors and running on busy nodes. Now the performance is not going to be as good as in the stage. So the thinking here is like maybe in the stage we want to have limits um, so people have an expectation of what are they going to get, the best the minimum they're going to get in production, right? Because otherwise, like, oh, my stage tests were great, but now production is not, so that's going to be very confusing. Yes. So I, I guess I've got to follow up on that one. So what, do you enforce some sort of a resource code, or do you enforce a strategy more upstream, let's say, whether you're using scaling groups or you're using Carpenter type of implementation where you've got specific node groups for specific workloads? Um, no, or we don't do, do you that. Get more close to the namespace level resource code or limitations like no we don't we don't do separate node pools for separate workloads um, with one caveat that I'm going to talk about in a bit um, that's a possi there's definitely a possibility that you may want to do if that makes sense it just complicates things a little bit but there's tools like uh, now carpenter carpenter the auto scaler uh, I think it's supported now, well, it's supported by AWS, it's open source, but it's also adopted by Azure, and, and you can run your own. Carpenter will look at different considerations and do auto, smart auto-scaling, where it will look at, uh, oh, okay, so you are using, you, you have pods that require 64 CPUs. Okay, I'm going to start a node that has at least 64 CPUs. Oh, but you are now, you have a mix of pods that have a memory CPU ratio 1 to 4, and now another ones that have 1 to 32. And I'm going to, okay, I'm going to start different types of nodes so you can uh, optimize the cost and optimize how the workloads are scheduled in Kubernetes. So this is Carpenter, what it does. And also the price, you can, uh, it can also uh, start, well, it will uh, try to start the cheapest uh, sizes that you need. So it doesn't make any sense. If, you, if your queue of Kubernetes pods waiting to be scheduled um, is, uh, oh, just five CPUs, it's not gonna start a node that need, has 120 CPUs. So it's gonna do some smart things without, because before that you have to manually go and say, okay, I want a node pool that has this size with this type of VMs, with this memory CPU ratio, or if you have many of them, you have to have define all of those, yeah. But you can still introduce discipline when you're defining your carpenter definition, right? So you can say, do not do this, this Yeah, you, sizes, you, in right? carpenter you can configure it to do different types of things, yes. Uh, and what I was talking about, we use a different node pool with ARM uh, CPUs. So we estimate that we get like 15 to 25% savings for the same performance. And it's very easy to switch, if, especially if you are running Java, to just switch the base container to, an up, to another JDK that is built on ARM, done. Nothing else to do. I mean, you just have to test that nothing breaks, but that's it. Anybody using ARM here? No? Well, you should, be, you should think about it because you're going to save money. If, if anything, just, well, you're going to save money and you're going to warm less the planet. 
that's the other benefit. So that's that's a win-win. Anybody here doing Java? Yes, one, per two, okay. Um, I'm gonna skip a bit through the quiz because it's very Java oriented, but in Java, the, the way the, the Java JVM, and, and this is similar for other, for other uh, languages, you have to be aware of how it decides how much CPU is gonna use, how much memory is gonna use. Like in Java, uh, the default heap size, when you run Java in a container, it depends. So depending on what's the size of the container, the JVM is gonna take more or less memory. So it's very hard to figure that out, I mean, to, to, to get it right. And if you use the defaults, you are wasting money because the default, if you have a no normal container, the default is gonna just use 25% of the container memory for the heap size. Uh, so that's a waste of, of money. Um, this was improved late in, the, in previous versions of Java, um, but uh, let's skip that. But you can, the thing is, you can configure the, the RAM that you want for the heap. And you should do it because otherwise you're running just with 25% of, of the memory of the container and you're wasted a lot because for us, I think we are running around 80%. So that's, that's a lot of money and that you are wasting. Yeah, typically you can use 75% in Java unless you have things that use off-heap memory like Elasticsearch and Spark. But it's, it's kind of similar for, for, other, for other languages. On Java, we also have the garbage collector, and depending on how big the container is, the JVM is gonna pick one or another. So it's also tricky that, oh, I'm, I'm, if you're running some tests in a, in a smaller container, this, those tests may be wrong when you run in a slightly bigger container because Java decides that, oh, because I have a little bit more CPU, I'm, I'm gonna switch the implementation of the garbage collector. So that's also tricky. And you can also configure it on Java with, with, uh, with flags. And there's, there's a garbage collectors table that uh, Microsoft released, but it depends also on, on your use case. Um, the CPUs that Java, we, the, Java, the JVM will see also is in, intriguing because um, depending on which version of Java you are running, and uh, it's gonna use a different number, and depending on how many you assign to the container. And they changed this lately to, to do the, as many as the OS allows, because before it was, it was calculating it with C groups, and it was not quite right. Uh, what it meant before, if you say to between zero and 1,023 milli CPUs, you get assigned one CPU. If you set to 10,024, you get nothing, no limits. If you say, and then it was more or less normal. But now, uh, yeah, there was, uh, there was an improvement to the JDK. And yeah, basically you can set the active processor count if you want to tell the JVM, hint the JVM on how many CPUs it should see. And that's, um, and, and this is about the, the request and the limits that I was talking about before. So let's say you have a 32 CPU, and this applies not just for Java, for any process that you run. You have a 32 CPU host, two JVMs, or two processes with the same request. What is the maximum CPU that you can use? If you set the limit to eight CPUs, the maximum they're gonna use is eight each. So you're wasting 16. If you set it to 16, well, they can use maximum 16. So if both are busy, you are okay. If one of them is not busy, you are wasting CPU. But if you don't say set any limit, so that the question that, that came before, uh, you can use uh, any, any process, any of the two processes can use up to the 32. So that's, 
it's never going to starve one another, but you can use the whole CPU of the, of the node, which at the end of the day is money. The other important bit is how do we scale Kubernetes, right? How do we scale the pods? How do we scale these things? So we don't have to manually go and change things or we don't have to have hu humongous clusters all the time. On Kubernetes, there's three types of autoscalers. Uh, you have the cluster autoscaler, the horizontal pod autoscaler, and the vertical pod autoscaler. The cluster autoscaler is increasing the number of nodes that the cluster has based on CPU and memory requests. So that's in the important bit there. And uh, we set the, well, it's important to set the maximum nodes that you want at the cluster level because uh, bugs can happen. And this, of course, saves us a lot of money because you don't, you don't want to run at full capacity all the time. So a typical uh, scenario is you get, we get more requests, more scale up, and then Kubernetes scales the number of nodes, and then when there's no traffic, there's less CPU usage, whatever, the number of nodes goes down. That's the typical CISO uh, pattern. But another interesting one that happened to us here is suddenly this went up to 100 something, 140 something, 150, and this didn't grow up more because we had a limit on the number of nodes, thank God. And this what happened is we had a, there was a bug here on the autoscaling process. If not, this would have like keep going up. So the bug was fixed and then things be went back to normal. So that's why it's important to have a max node or a, a very big credit card to pay for your cloud spend. The vertical pod autoscaler will increase or decrease the resources for each pod. So um, suddenly you say, oh, okay, this pod would, uh, because it's getting a lot of requests, it would benefit from having more memory. You can define that, but uh, until the very last version of Kubernetes, this requires the restart of pods. And you can set it to automatic on next, or on next start. And this is now uh, a alpha or beta feature, alpha, of, of, the, of the last one. So that's tricky. Um, we use it to, to only, uh, we used it, not anymore, uh, to develop our environments to scale them down if unused. And the, um, if you set it to automatic, well, you, you take the risk that your pods are suddenly doing poof, and then you may get an outage. So that's, be very careful of, of what you're doing there. And the horizontal pod autoscaler is having more pods whenever you get more traffic, more CPU, more whatever metric you wanna, you wanna measure it for. And we scale on CPU and HTTP requests per minute, and it's, uh, it's obvious when you read now, but not always obvious for everybody. You cannot use the same metrics as for the VPA. You can have both configured at the same time, but not on the same metrics because then you're gonna have a mix of scales at the same time and it's not gonna be great. It's gonna be confusing. Um, CPU is a bit tricky. It was a tricky for us because um, you can have this periodic task or a startup CPU spikes for Java, I think it's more very common. The pod is starting now. There's a lot of things to be done at the very startup. And then this, the CPU goes crazy. And if you don't configure it right, is, uh, the HPA is going to say, oh, your CPU went out very high. I need to start another pod. The other pod that starts goes very high on CPU. Oh, I need to start another pod. So this happened. And so you need to be careful on this because uh, you can configure a lot of things like what is the ramp up time, the startup time, all these things, because you are just doing a denial of service on yourself. And this is what, we, we have a bunch of these problems where we, we are running at a scale that we can easily do a distributed denial of, of service internally. There's some horror stories there. But yeah, I mean, you, you change something, but it's running across thousands of places, and now suddenly 
one it doesn't one is not important, but a thousand times it's it screws up things. So yeah, that's the spice on the startup can can do the 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 cascading effect. So to sum it up, three things that I if if you want to remember three things is that on Kubernetes it's very easy to start and then optimize. So it's very easy to do lift and shift to Kubernetes, existing application, just put it in a container, run it. Uh, there's some things to consider, like database, especially state, is, is, is the, the tricky part. Uh, you can use patterns to decompose the application, sidecars, init containers, new services, operators, so you don't have to add things to the monolith. And on the resource optimization part, because money seems to be important for people. If you heard Corey la last night, uh, money seems to be moving the world and things are expensive in the cloud. Uh, you can uh, tune this JVM CPU, you can tune the memory on, this, on Java, the garbage collection, and so on, and you can use all the auto-scaling capabilities that Kubernetes provides. So if you have any questions. How about a couple questions. Yes. One, um, you talked a lot about JVM resources and management of those. Um, how much discipline did you, guys, did you guys have because of the extent of the number of clusters you have in the upstream base container images for these Java applications? That's one question. Second, how much? Sorry, the base container image, like that, the size of it, like how? Oh, the the size right. of the images of the containers themselves. Right, right. Okay. So that's one one question. Uh, like, did you have a strategy for using certain types of container based images? Second question is, you didn't you didn't talk about Kubernetes jobs in your clusters. Did you have those scenarios as well in your ecosystem, mm -hmm. and how did that play oh, yeah. into the role? So the image, base images, we don't, I mean, we use some uh, JDK images that are built internally at Adobe for the main application, for other uh, services, whoever builds the service picks up an image. We don't care too much for now about the size of the images, but there's some approaches that we are looking at at improving the, the download time and the startup time. Obviously, it's caching the images at the cluster level, at the regional level, and so on. There's some features that I know for sure Azure has about streaming images. So if you have a very big image that you need it to be so big, you can uh, configure it so it will stream the image and get the layers, the main layers that you need to start up early, start up early while the rest is being downloaded. But so far, yeah, we're looking at some optimizations, but we didn't give it too much thought or too much importance um, because there was, there are other things that are more in the critical path. And for the question about the jobs, yes, we run some jobs, but there's nothing really. The only tr one of the tricky things is uh, when you use Prometheus and you use jobs because the jobs are ephemeral, you need to use the Prometheus push gateway to send the metrics instead of getting the metrics. So making sure, and also the logs, making sure that your container um, termina idle termination period is a bit longer, so you have time to ship the laws, things like that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sorry, I'll start. Right. Yes, I'm just curious, for the amount of uh, infrastructure and stuff for, for caring for your Kubernetes clusters, can you give me like h approximately uh, how many human resources you need to basically maintain and operate this at this scale? How many people? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, thousands of people? No, no. I mean, so we have uh, we have teams, a team that builds the clusters for us and maintains more of the core of the cluster. So those does the operates. So they are doing this for the whole Adobe or for a, a lot of different products. And so there's this, I guess nowadays it's a platform team, right? They provide Kubernetes as a service internally. And so this is a bunch of people also building new features. I mean, you have to, 
to consider. It's not just maintaining what it is there, it's building the new features, having new things coming in, new services, and so on. And then as, as uh, on top of that, we run the services, uh, I mean, the whole product is probably, the, the total thing is, is uh, hundreds of people, but it's, it's not just maintaining, it's building new features, building new stuff, providing new business value. Yeah, if, if you run on if you run on top of a cloud provider Kubernetes service, and we are only talking about purely the Kubernetes service, you don't need a lot of people. But purely the Kubernetes service. So, okay, making sure the cluster is up, the cluster is not crashing, upgrading the clusters. Yes. Yes. Yes, and the scale, I mean, if, if, if we, we have 45 clusters ourselves and keep growing them, if we run on-premise, there's, there's a lot more things that we have to consider. We already have to ask cloud providers saying, hey, we want to run in this region. Are you going to have capacity for us? Uh, are you going to have arm nodes? Are you going to have this? Are you going to have that? The reserve, yeah, we have reserve capacity also. But uh, cloud, cloud. Sorry? Still, I guess scale, that's something you have to consider. Yes, um, and cloud providers, uh, there are some, is n uh, infinite capacity, there's something that is not infinite about it. <laughs> so what they sell about infinite capacity is not that infinite. I know a case of a cloud provider that is migrating people off of a region. They're saying like, this region no longer can onboard anything, and you have to move off. And we're giving you time to move off because this region is gone, it's done. Or, uh, oh, there's a launch of a new region, and uh, you need, I cannot give you 100 VMs because probably they have a hundred for from somebody, a hundred for somebody else, and whatever, and they have to measure that capacity. So that's uh, at at some scale. There's there's that's something that you also have to consider. Yes. So it sounds like you chose namespaces to do the multi-tenancy. I'm just wondering if any other strategies were considered. Yeah. So the namespaces isolation is the, the, the few things I mentioned. It's not total isolation. We also look at Kata containers for, uh, so Kata containers is a pro open source project where you can run containers, pods as a VM. So each pod is a, effectively a VM with a micro VM with the hardware support that VMs have. So that makes it harder if you want somebody to explode, uh, getting out of the container, and so on. Um, we have issues, for instance, if, we, if you overcommit the nodes, if you say, OK, uh, I'm going to put, I have 32 gigs of memory. I'm going to put 32 containers with one, memory, one gig of memory request each. But the limit, I'm going to put it in 10. Now, any of, if any of those pods go over the limits, or, or if all of them go a bit over the limit, that node is, goes into a kernel out of memory. And now things get a bit weird for a bit until that, those pods get killed and rescheduled somewhere else, and, and the kernel is doing things. Uh, so you can still have noisy neighbors problems. Same thing with the CPU. Um, if you don't account for the requests and the limits correctly, CPU memory, uh, even disk space. If you have, um, another thing that happened to us is there was an issue with the cleanup of all the images 
because we were getting a lot of different images and big and so on, and the disk with the nodes were running out of disk space, and then suddenly is uh, they have to enter in this loop of I have to delete something, I download something, but then that something gets evicted because there's no room for the image, and now it has to be rescheduled somewhere else. So it was this continuous loop of downloading the image, filling up disks, kicking out things for other, to other places that also get filled, and, and because you are kicking out things and downloading, uh, scheduling a new pod, now you are filling it more. So we have, for instance, that issue. So we, you still have, the multi-tenancy in Kubernetes is not just pure multi-tenancy. You were talking also about quite a lot about like optimization of the cluster and, and everything around that. And I was wondering, have you looked in, into deshadowing of workloads kind of thing to improve the pin packing of, of the nodes? Of, of, yeah. of the nodes, so like... Yeah, uh, the pin packing, yes. Yeah. yeah, but like currently when Kubernetes decides where to run a pod, it's, that pod is, is, is tied to the node. And due to the lifetime, like say for example, uh, deployments have happened, like you your clusters can be less optimized. Mm -hmm. And I know there was some project out there that, that de-shadowed, like the did, did yeah. some optimizations and did some de-shadowing into the things, but I've never seen that go anywhere. And like at my previous employer, for example, um, we wrote our own controller to try to de shadow workloads to run on spot VMs, for example. Uh, have, is, are these kind of things that, that you're looking into with Adobe as well? Yeah, we use the descheduler. So this, the descheduler is another controller uh, operator that will look at how your things in the cluster are and will kick out pods of the nodes. For example, uh, you are saying, I think, um, if you say, uh, I, w I want to scale down the cluster, maybe you cannot scale down because the nodes are a bit busy. So the, the scheduler will go and say, okay, these pods that are in nodes that are not busy, out. So that node can be deleted. Another one, uh, interesting one, is when you have uh, multi-availability song uh, spread. So you say, I want to run three pods of this service, and I want one of them in each availability zone. So Kubernetes will go and schedule them. Um, well, let's, let's say it's six spots. It's going to make the sample better. So Kubernetes is going to go and put two in each availability zone. Okay. Now suddenly the HPA or the node needs to go away because your cluster is scaling down or whatever. And two pods in this availability zone, in one of the availability zones, go away because whatever reason, this can happen in Kubernetes. Pure Kubernetes is not going to care about that. So you're saying, oh, I need to scale down. Uh, I'm going to take this node uh, and this node and this, these two uh, pods are in that node. They're gone or because anything else. You, so you end with two pods in one availability song and two in another one and nothing in the third one. The descheduler can do, you can configure the descheduler to say correct the spread across availability zones. So it will kick out pods from the other ones to make sure that they are spread out correctly. Because by default, Kubernetes is not going to do it. So if you have HPA and availability zone, uh, as HPA can go uh, send up and down the number of pods, HPA also doesn't care about spread after the pods are scheduled. So there's nothing really that cares about spread after the pods are scheduled. You have to rely on the descheduler to kick out things if they're not correct. No, it cleans out the pods. It's just that you end with a spread that is not what you want. So it's, if for whatever reason, uh, yeah, uh, you, you have six pods running across three availability zones. The HPA says, oh, you don't need six. You only need four. It may decide to kill two in the same availability zone. There's no real measure of which one to kill. So 
you may end with two in, in four in two availability zones or all in one, things like this happen. And you need the scheduler that to, to go there and say, oh, the spread is wrong, I'm gonna kick things out. So Kubernetes starts new pods and when, when it schedules the pods is when it looks at where it, in which availability zone should I put it. Yeah, it will put it back in and correct it, yes. So you're saying that it's not active monitoring. It's, it's yeah. Whenever you start up, that's when it will tell you what spread is. Kubernetes, once you, when it is the basic Kubernetes, once you schedule a pod, that pod is going to be there until something else kills it, like an HPA or the node goes down or anything. Is your available? Uh, is the oh, it, or is the um, is that like a namespace is across availability zone in your configuration? Uh, a namespace is a virtual thing. Uh -huh. You don't care if it's av across availability zones or not. A deploy the a deployment or a stateful set can be across availability zones. You have to configure the um, pod topology is called and configure it in the way that you want. So you can say, I want a minimum of one pod in each availability zone, or I want uh, no more than two difference, uh, the difference. You, 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 you configure this queue. So if you have one pod in one availability zone, do not have more than three in the other ones. It's, it's a bit complicated, but you configure it with pod topologies. And that's when Kubernetes schedules, looks at the pod topologies, and decides in which nodes to, to do it. And this is all with labels on the nodes. So it's not, I mean, I don't think it's aware of the concept of an availability song. You just set no labels in nodes. For instance, for ARM, we are building multi-architecture multi images that can run on both ARM and uh, uh, Intel. And we say, in the pod topology, we say, schedule this in ARM if available, and if not, schedule it in Intel. Because otherwise, you, it may not be able to be scheduled. But essentially, yeah. that requires your, your nodes to have selectors on them. Like yes, all the nodes have yeah. to have the labels, the yeah. selectors, everything configured correctly. Yes. Yeah. So it seems like you ran into a few issues when you're migrating to Kubernetes. One obscure one that I heard about when I was in another talk was that in clusters where there are, I think, hundreds to thousands of nodes, it can applying a, applying a deployment can be inconsistent due to etcd not being scalable enough. I'm wondering yep. if you ever ran into anything like that. So we also have that issue, not because of the number of nodes, but because of the number of objects. Etcd has a limit of eight gigabytes. When you get close to that limit, uh, it becomes read-only, and you cannot do anything, and your cluster is pretty much gone, <laughs> and you have to recover it from a backup. Yes, and then what happens is one is the that that would be like the worst case scenario, right? You uh, you have too many objects, uh, you fill it up, and it's gone. Another thing that may happen is you have so many objects that uh, the Kubernetes API takes a long time to respond. You can have uh, the watchers in Kubernetes also consume memory, so every time you mount a secret or you mount a config map by default, that adds a watcher, and those watchers consume memory on the API. If you have a few, it's okay. If you have thousands, that's a problem. And that limits how much you can scale the cluster because now suddenly the API, every time you make a request, it can take longer and longer. And if it gets over one minute, the API cancels the request. So once your API calls get close to the minute, you are in big trouble because nothing will work. Like the autoscaler is not gonna work, the scheduling is not gonna work, the deleting pods is not gonna work, things like that. The traffic, uh, the ingress controller is watching the API to know where to send the traffic, 
your external traffic is not going to work. So you got to be careful about that too. Uh, you have to keep the, you have to watch for the number of watchers, the number of memory that the API is using, the number of objects that you are using in the cluster. So, uh, first advice, don't use set CD as a database. <laughs> don't use Kubernetes API as a database. Don't use the Kubernetes objects as a database. So that's, that's the one, because it's very convenient. Oh, I'm just going to store things here in this secret, on this config map. Don't do that. That's the first one. And then if you have a scale where you have thousands of secrets, thousands of config maps, objects, and so on, try to refactor it in a way, or limit the size of the clusters. That's the only way out. We, we are going, we're not growing the clusters way bigger because we don't, we have these scaling problems. We try to go now with more and smaller clusters. Be Using Postgres, uh, there's there's no the only supported really supported way to to put a storage backend is uh, for Kubernetes is etcd. Who? Yeah, well, K3 K3S K3 is not something that you would yeah. want to run in production for loads. No, there's I mean you. Uh, if, you're, if your problem is I'm storing too much data in config maps or something, yes, use a database to store that data. Don't use Kubernetes API. There's no reason why you should be storing gigabytes of data on the API. Right. Uh, there's also some tricks like you can limit the defaults. In Kubernetes, the default for the number of pods that it are kept in the history is 10. You can say, oh, or, or the re, um, replica sets, things like that. If you have many of them, there's a, you can say, oh, don't, don't keep 10, just keep three. Helm, Helm is the same thing. History, 10 by default. Don't keep 10, just keep three. There's small tricks like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, well, thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Now you can, you can, you can go.